Aliens have been around since the dawn of time. Mankind has given them many names, angels, ghosts, demons, and more. We look to the skies and wonder, but the truth about aliens visiting planet Earth is much more profound. It is so startling and so strange that no one has thought to look in that particular direction. Our ancestors developed ways of contacting these aliens, and they called them gods. They were beings of light, shining ones, watchers. They were both good and bad, mirroring humanity. They gave great knowledge, and after tens of thousands of years, mankind suddenly had the ability to create civilization. We built huge monuments in their name, and we recorded our contact with them in fables, myths, legends, folklore, and religion. They were our gods, and we worshiped them and recorded their powers, deeds, and lives. These gods of the world were in fact not real gods, whatever that means. They were in fact alien invaders, and we were the subjects of their rule. This is the true story of the aliens in the ancient world. Before we look at sightings and archaeological evidence, we must understand what it is we're looking for. Thankfully, our ancestors left behind a trail of clues that we have taken the wrong way. The beliefs and worship of ancient gods around the world has fogged our view. Over 5,000 years before Christ, an amazing thing happened that would change the course of human history. Hidden from us by misunderstanding, mistranslation, and clouded in mythology, the birth of religion on this planet was no mere accident. It was the result of an alien invasion on a vast scale, and it sparked the worship of the ancient aliens as gods. These gods are the oldest recorded figures of worship anywhere in history. They are the root of all major world religions. They gave rise to the great powers of Egypt, Mesopotamia, and more. They spread outwards around the world and were the genesis of a special holy bloodline that remains with us today. One of their descendants would be caught, beaten, and crucified, and yet he would rise from his grave, unrecognizable, 
and accompanied by messengers of light. He would ascend in the sky, having cast off his shrouded skin. His bloodline would give rise to the royal families of the entire world. His bloodline would be protected, defended, and would control the globe. He was a descendant of the great serpent elite who came to earth as beings of light to create, control, and teach mankind. He was a descendant of the great giant killer, David, a memory of the great battle that was fought between the serpent elite and the sons of alien and man. All of this is actually written in the historical records. They were known as giants in the land. The aliens escaped Earth, but left behind their seed and tools of power and communication. It is prophesied that they shall return, and the signs are growing daily that they have returned and are right now dealing with their own elite bloodline, the men in power. Original worship on this planet is that of the serpent. That is a historical fact, and yet it is within every single religion. It is in all the myths of the world, and they all tell the same story. In the beginning, the serpent was the wise one the only animal in the Bible to speak freely with his own mind and voice, the tempter, and yet also the holder of ultimate wisdom and the elixir of life. Mankind, in comparison to this remarkable animal, appeared foolish. From that day forward, the serpent would control man. That serpent was a reptilian alien holding the technological power to seed humanity and the wisdom of another civilization. The very genetic makeup of mankind altered from this moment. We cannot say exactly when. We cannot pinpoint the so-called Garden of Eden in time, but we can piece together the remarkable story of the moment the serpent aliens came from the skies. We can uncover the story of what happened next and how it has affected our own time. The truth is, descendants of aliens do walk among us right now. To many, the very idea that the serpent is hidden within our religious and mythology will seem bizarre. In Christianity and other faiths, it is reviled, and this itself is a folk memory of a fearful and warring past between mankind and the serpent aliens. Nevertheless, the historical truth is that the serpent is there, and it is the root of all major religions. This has been proven again and again, both from scriptures and archaeology. Baal was an abbreviation for Ab El, the serpent god or shining serpent. 
The shining aspect of the serpent reveals a subtle clue. The serpent was indeed seen in the sky and shone down upon us. This is why in Egypt, for instance, we will see the sun, or Aten, wrapped with a snake, and why the serpent was worldwide seen as a symbol of the sun. It was these shining ones, or serpents, which were the lights in the sky that descended to earth. They were lights that our ancestors saw in the sky, the sun, moon, and stars, but these lights came down to earth and settled amongst us. The lights were the ships, the craft of the strange serpent-like humanoids that stepped off and walked among mankind. The Greeks called Baal, Belair, which means a dragon or great serpent. Baal is the Assyro-Babylonian version of the gods Enlil and Marduk, the same Baal seen throughout the Bible. So the Baal in the Bible is a Babylonian serpent god, one of the ancient lights of wisdom that descended to earth. These tales are global. The European Beltane should be rendered by Altan, both words signifying the dragon or serpent. The general term used for early Christian Gnostics was Orphites, which means serpent worshipers. It was this group that wrote the New Testament. Epiphanius said, the Orphites sprung out of the Nicolaitans and Gnostics and were so called from the serpent which they worshipped. They taught that the ruler of this world was of a draconic form, and the Orphites attribute all wisdom to the serpent of paradise and say that he was the author of the knowledge of men. An amazing declaration which speaks volumes the guardians of the very history and religion that would become Christianity was in fact based on and fostered by those who worshipped the ancient wise alien serpent that came and taught mankind. The ruler of this world was of draconic form. It was the dragon, the winged serpent, the shining serpent that could fly. It was ultimately wise and should be worshipped as a god. A third century Persian teacher known as Mani, who said that Christianity had got things wrong and he was here to put it right, attempted to revive these old ways. Regardless of the Christian attempts to kill off Manichaeism, it survived until the 13th century. He is said to have revived Ophiloetreia, or serpent worship, where he taught that Christ was an incarnation of the great serpent who glided over the cradle of the Virgin Mary when she was asleep at the age of a year and a half. This is a folk memory of their powers of genetic manipulation, but the worship of the serpent was much more ancient than even Manny stated. In Britain, the serpent god was Hugh, the dragon ruler of the world a statement remarkably similar to that of the Orphites. The Druid was known as a Ganader, now known as an Aider. And as the Aider was the symbol of the god Hugh, the Druids were Orphites of the original stock. They also worshiped Beli, or Baal. So, in this respect, the Druids were probably the last truly serpent-worshipping priests in Europe. A remnant of ancient days, long forgotten, but remembered in words and deeds. 
Over thousands of years across hundreds of cultures, the history of this ancient invasion by the great shining ones from the heavens altered and became legend and myth. Much of it turned into great religions of the planet. But hidden in these stories is the real, literal truth of an invasion of planet Earth by beings so strange that we call them serpents. Ancient man left cave paintings and tales of their coming across the world. The great guardians of the Shining Ones, known as the Watchers, mated with human females and a hybrid bloodline was born. It became the bloodline of the rulers of our globe and was protected and kept secret. Up until around 5000 BC, we know that mankind had no great civilizations. It had been this way for a millennia. Then suddenly, at the very time we know the Shining Ones came and taught humanity, it all changed. Suddenly, civilizations erupted. The Sumerians migrated to Mesopotamia, towards something that seemed to attract them. This is the period of tales of a great cataclysm, what we know as the Flood. Judgment came from above because the gods were angry and dealt humanity a cruel blow. These tales are worldwide. Civilizations erupted and great learning spread far and wide. The all-powerful symbol of the swastika emerged, which is in reality four serpents overlapping. Serpent rock art appears all over the world. This is the period that Enoch tells us was the time of war between those who had come down from the sky, the angels, Nephilim, the Shining Ones. These were the great shining serpents who had magical flaming swords and wheel-like or disc-like ships that flew around the sky. As the scribe of the Shining Ones, Enoch himself was shielded from death and taken away by the aliens to live out his days in heaven. Christians today know him as the man who walked with God, and the reason is simple. God came down to earth and walked on our soil, spoke with Enoch, and then returned. Whatever this means, it does reveal that ancient man witnessed something remarkable. In truth, this was the period of the ancient invasion of planet Earth by the shining race of serpents who came from the sky. Our ancestors worshiped them for their amazing power, and yet, in our modern scientific age, we now see things more clearly. They were not angels or messengers of light. They were not great Greek deities sat on high and issuing commands. They were not the many-faced Hindu or Egyptian gods. These were beings from another planet or even dimension who came here with superior technology. They created mankind as the Egyptian Book of the Dead states. I am the Lord of the Red Crown, which is on the head of the Shining One, he who gives life to mankind from the heat of his mouth. They helped mankind start civilization. They bred with us. They fought with each other. Most, we are told, left. But the hybrid race remained among us as special people. And now, with every passing day, NASA tells us that we have discovered yet another Earth-like planet that could sustain life. They find ancient rivers and lakes on Mars, and even fatty acids within the Martian soil. 
They alter their equations on the existence of alien life on a weekly basis. Even they are growing more and more aware that soon they will discover something special. The question is, will we awaken the ancient invaders and will they return if they're not already here? The oldest and most widespread depiction of aliens is very surprising. Images of ancient gods abound, but none of them are more prolific than the serpent. It is seen across the world in every culture, religion, and tradition. It always has special powers. Indeed, it is because of this widespread use that it has entered into popular culture, films, and television shows such as Stargate. In order to understand the alien serpent a little more, we should take a look at the language used to name and describe it by our ancestors. The snake is known in the language of Canaan variously as Ab, Ob, Of, Op, Ef, Ev. Amazingly, in the Mayan language, can means serpent, as in Kukulkan, the bird serpent. And just as in the ancient Sumerian, a can, and the Scottish can for serpent, which is where we get the word canny, like the wise snake. Vulcan, the Roman god of fire, comes from the Babylonian can for serpent and bull for fire, showing an etymological link across thousands of miles. Indeed, even the very center of the Christian world, the Vatican, comes from the words vatis for prophet and can for serpent, making the Vatican a place of serpent prophecy. The oracle that the biblical King Saul appealed to for prophecy was called the one that hath Ob, or the priestess of Ob, the snake. The snake worshippers of Moses' time and the area were known as Hivites, derived from Havia, or serpent, the root of Eve. Hivites became Orphites, the early Christian Gnostic serpent worshippers who claimed affinity with the Christians in the second century AD. Indeed, the very children of Israel intermarried with them and served their gods. They were also known as Bahalim, from Baal. Baal was a solar god, thought by John Bathurst Dean in his worship of the serpent traced throughout the world to be an abbreviation of Ab-El, the serpent god or shining serpent. The shining aspect of the serpent reveals to us that these were the bright ones of ancient times. The serpent was worshipped from the very beginning because it was the one who brought knowledge to mankind. It was the symbol of other deities with likewise attributes. In the serpent and Shiva worship, C. Staniland Wake remarks about the Muslim saint of Upper Egypt is still thought to appear under the form of a serpent and to cure the diseases which afflict the pilgrims of his shrine. These alien serpents, therefore, brought not only great knowledge to mankind, but also healing. In fact, the truth of the matter is that if we believe the ancient texts about these otherworldly beings, then we must also believe that they gave us life. They genetically engineered life on planet Earth. We can see this and more in the origin fables of the Bible. Clemens Alexandria said that Hyvia, the root of Eve, means female serpent. If we pay attention to the strict sense of the Hebrew, the name Evia aspirated signifies a female serpent. It is connected to the same Arabic root, which means both life and serpent. The Persians even called the constellation serpents the little Ava or Eve. So Eve is the bringer of life, and she is called the serpent. In Old Akkadian, Ad signifies father, and therefore Adam is the father of mankind. 
The other and important point to note is that Adam and Eve were initially immortal and Eve gained her wisdom via the serpent on the tree of knowledge. As for Cain and Abel, according to Hyde Clark and C. Staniland Wake in Serpent and Shiva Worship, Abel and Cain are names given to elder and younger brothers. Abel resolves into Abe or snake and El into shining, and therefore he is a snake god or shining snake. According to rabbinical tradition, Cain was not the son of Adam at all, but rather the son of Asmodeus, the serpent spirit, who is Araman in Persian Zoroastrianism. These are just a few of the serpent deities seen around the world in all cultures and religions. These ancients could not leave us photographs or video, so they wrote their experiences and observation up in texts that became religions. But there are also many ancient sightings of aliens and unidentified flying objects throughout history. One of the first is the disputed Thule papyrus in which the scribes of the pharaoh Thutmosis III reported that fiery disks were encountered floating over the skies. There are factual problems with this early text though, but Egypt is awash with tales of the gods. These gods are aliens, and if we now look at them in this light, then suddenly it becomes more real. Each of the gods had their own attribute. They gave life to mankind. They taught us wisdom, agriculture, science, and much more. They have special powers, and they look very different to us. The god king of Egypt would wear the serpent upon his brow as a symbol of his inner knowledge given to him by the shining serpents. But there are older sightings. The Obeid period runs from 6500 to 3800 BC and is a prehistoric period of Mesopotamia. Now with all the knowledge we have of the widespread form of serpent worship, we look at this remote historical period for more clues, but we actually don't have to look too far. The Obeid female serpent mother goddess is an image of precisely what we have been discussing. She is the giver of life an early form of Mary, the mother of God. She is a reptilian serpent being. She is from the very origins of civilization. Is this a symbol of the origin of mankind? Did the reptilian aliens genetically create man? In fact, the ancient Sumerian myth of Enuma Elise inscribed on cuneiform tablets and part of the library of Ashurbanipal says humankind was created to serve gods called the Ananuka. The Ananuka were aliens who came to earth to mine gold for their own uses. According to the Enuma Elise story, the Ananuka realized mining gold was taking a toll on their race and then created the human race as slaves. The Ananuka and the history surrounding them are worth a deeper look. This is the tale of one of the earliest of all origins of secret societies in alien tales and from where is derived much of the technology and symbolism still used today by the Freemasons, Rosicrucians, and many others. It is the tale of the Watchers, otherwise known as the Stunts of God, and in Hebrew as Aram. Zechariah Sitchin in The Stairway to Heaven states, the Akkadians called their predecessors Sumerians and spoke of the land of Sumer, it was in fact the biblical land of Shinar. It was the land whose name Sumer literally meant the land of the watchers. It was indeed the Egyptian Tanader, land of the watchers, the land from which gods had come to Egypt. So Samaria could mean land of the watchers, and it is from this land that the Elohim, or shining ones, who govern the watchers also came. 
This is the land of the origins and the governing gods. These are the aliens of ancient times. Julian Jaynes, in The Origin of the Consciousness, in the breakdown of the bicaramel mine, tells us something interesting about these governing gods. Throughout Mesopotamia, from the earliest times of the Sumer and Akkad, all lands were owned by gods and men were their slaves. Of this, the cuneiform texts leave no doubt whatsoever. Each city-state had its principal god, and the king was described in the very earliest written documents that we have as the tenant farmer of the god. Anyone who has seen the movie Stargate will now see just where this modern TV show first got its ideas. So let's just take a look at these Elohim for a moment to find out who these gods were that enslaved men and were in charge of the Watchers. The term Elohim used often in the Old Testament and other texts outside of it, as in the Muslim Allah for the Lord. This is an incorrect usage as the term is plural and means shining ones. We can see this plurality in the text from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And again in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. This term, sons of God, is literally sons of gods and comes from Ben Ha'olim, sons of the shining ones. The term, in fact, seems to be around the globe. The Sumerian El means simply bright or shining. The Old Irish Elil means shining. Old Cornish El means shining. Elf means shining. Hence, elves as tall and mysterious angelic beings. The Inca, Ella, is bright or to shine. Babylonian, Elu, is to shine. There are more, but they all relate to the gods or special shining beings that created, taught, and controlled mankind. They owned us. Baal, the deity often spoken of as the Lord in the Bible, is also seen as a shining one in the Old Testament and is called the owner. At that time, there were many owners or shining ones. In fact, there was one for each village. These are the governors of men, shining reptilian alien beings with vast knowledge, and their existence has been passed down to us in religious texts, fables, folklore, and myths. According to General Albert Pike, the famous Masonic historian, in Morals and Dogma, the Elohim were the host of heaven, ascending and descending to pass messages to and from God or the leader Yahweh. These beings came down to us from the heavens and back again. If this is not evidence of ancient aliens, then what is? Some of the Shining Ones were termed Watchers and are akin to the angels of the Lord. Yahweh Elohim means simply, Leader of the Shining Ones. So now we have these plural Elohim or Shining Ones as gods being above even the kings and supplying Watchers to watch over man. The Egyptian Book of the Dead calls these watchers Anubis or Horus. They came from a faraway place. According to the legend of Wotan from Mesoamerica, Wotan was the serpent who was a descendant of the race of Can and was called a guardian or watcher. The Hebrews termed these watchers as those who watch. In the Greek, this is translated as gigantes or giants, a race that even the 907 BC writer Hesiod 
featured as being monstrous due to their serpentine aspect. Now we understand the role of the giants that are seen across the world of folklore as the presence of the alien watchers. Enoch gives us the names of these watchers, and these are the names of the holy angels who watch. Uriel, one of the holy angels who is over the world and over Tartarus. Raphael, one of the holy angels who is over the spirits of Ben. Ragel, one of the holy angels who takes vengeance on the world of the luminaries. Michael, one of the holy angels to wit, he that is set over the best part of mankind and over chaos. Sarah Gael, one of the holy angels who is set over the spirits who sin in spirit. Gabriel, one of the holy angels who is over paradise and the serpents and the cherubim. Remiel, one of the holy angels whom God set over those who rise. Note that Gabriel, the messenger, who told of the birth of Jesus and who passed on wisdom to Muhammad, is in charge of the serpents. In the Testament of Amram, we have remarkable insight into the aspects of these shining watchers. I asked them, Who are you, that you are thus empowered over me? They answered me, we have been empowered and rule over all mankind. They said to me, Which of us do you choose to rule you? I raised my eyes and looked. One of them was terrifying in his appearance, like a serpent, his cloak many colored yet very dark. And I looked again, and in his appearance, his visage like a viper. The Mosaic Book of Jubilees was originally called the Apocalypse of Moses, as it was supposedly written by Moses whilst on Mount Sinai and dictated by a watcher or angel. This book, dictated by an alien watcher, was intended as a history of the days of old and reveals the purpose of the watchers. For in his days, the angels of the Lord descended upon the earth those who are named watchers, that they should instruct the children of men, that they should do judgment and uprightness upon the earth. These watchers, according to the Book of Jubilees, are the sons of God spoken of in Genesis sent from their heavenly abode to instruct men. What seems to have occurred is that they fell from grace by mating with the daughters of men and were thus outcast, giving us the fallen angels we are familiar with today. As Enoch himself has testified against these fallen watchers, he was protected by the ruling shining ones and transported to the Garden of Eden. The watchers called me, Enoch the scribe, and said to me, Enoch, though scribed of righteousness, go, declare to the watchers of the heaven, who have left the high heaven, the holy eternal place, and have defiled themselves with women, and have done as the children of the earth do, and have taken unto themselves wives. Ye have wrought great destruction on the earth, and ye shall have no peace nor forgiveness of sin. And insomuch as they delight themselves in their children, the murder of their beloved ones shall they see, and over the destruction of their children shall they lament, and shall make supplication unto eternity, but mercy and peace shall ye not attain. First Enoch chapter 10 verses 3 through 8. So all was not well with these ancient aliens. Some of them actually mated with human women and caused a lot of trouble. The fallen watchers swear an oath and bind themselves together. The place of this action is called Ardis, the fabled summit of Mount Hermon, which derives from the Hebrew word for curse. Following these actions of the fallen watchers, the shining ones call down a great flood upon the earth to destroy the offspring 
and Noah is warned to build a great ship to escape the impending doom. There was obviously some great battle between the dissenters and the shining ones and the loyal watchers, which gave rise to Michael, Gabriel, and the others to slay the remaining fallen watchers. There is great technology afoot here. Causing a massive flood upon the earth is not something even we could do today. There were other catastrophes written up as being the judgment of the remaining watchers. Indeed, even the spirits of these fallen watchers are blamed for future evils, as Enoch points out. And the spirits of the giants afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth, and cause trouble. They take no food, but nevertheless hunger and thirst, and cause offenses. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men and against the women, because they have preceded them. First Enoch chapter 12. Notable revelations admitted by the watchers to the sons of man were knowledge of the signs of the earth, writing, meteorology, geography, and geodesy all implying that these shining ones understood the energy and power of the earth and its electromagnetism and not to mention the movements of the planets. There are many fables of these times from across the world of great builders, architects, and magicians, all relating entirely back to these shining ones' origins. Much of this myth of the Watchers is found to be within the tales of wars and merging of peoples across the Middle East, between Canaanites, Egyptians, Sumerians, and even Asian civilizations. But the underlying current is a belief in the Shining Ones as leaders, with Watchers doing their bidding, eventually evolving into God with His angelic beings. The term Anunnaki, Anakim, and even Nephilim means those who came down to earth from heaven. They looked down on the people below, watched. The truth of the story of the Shining Ones and their watchers has been the subject of a purging by many Jewish authorities who were understandably concerned that the myths of these angels and their worship would detract the people from the worship of the one God. With this end, the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees mentioned above were stricken from the accepted list and are now known as Apographa or Pseudepigrapha. What we do know, though, is that these watchers continued in what has been described as the underground stream and were called egregors. The term egregor is Greek and means to rouse from sleep, be excited by passion, to be awake or to watch. Eliphas Levi, the 19th century magician and mystic, speaks of these egregors on numerous occasions and even links them to the giants or watchers spoken of in the Book of Enoch, saying that they take shape and have appeared in the guise of giants. These are the egregors of the Book of Enoch, termed the celestial watchers or egregors by the ancients. Levi also calls these egregors the Anakim, or Shining Ones, and men of renown or giants of the Bible, and they are expressed in the myths of various cultures, just as we have been finding. Amazingly, the infamous Necronomicon 
tells us about a fabulous city of Irem. A rim of the pillars is part of the Arabian magical lore and was built by the jinn or angels and were possibly also watchtowers or towers of the watchers. The pillars were built on the instructions of the Lord of the tribe of Ad, who are referred to in Hebrew terms as Nephilim, the giants or watchers of the shining ones, and referred to in the Book of Enoch as Irim. According to Arabian legend, this Arim is located in Rubak Kali, which means empty quarter or void. This void is space, the sky above us. The Thesaurus Temporum, translated into Latin in the mid-17th century, even gives us a chronology of events surrounding these egregores. In 1000 BC, they descended, and by 1487 BC, they had taken Enoch to paradise due to the descent of the fallen watchers. It seems then that the extremely ancient concept and story of the Shining Ones was still very much alive and being propagated secretly by the mystics of the last few hundred years. These were very much part and parcel of their hidden secrets. The question arises, why did they feel the need to hide such secrets? Whatever the reason, it is in fact that our modern day secret societies hold the knowledge of these ancient alien watchers. What we can see here then is the extent of the influence of the first origins of secret societies, both in culture and in texts. These shining ones are the first on paper. They have a structure and a basis of authority. They rule over men and are all wise, having their watchers to ensure that their instructions are carried out. Either the Shining Ones are still in power now generations later, or the secret societies of the globe have copied the methods, structure, and symbols of these first few. The great religions of the world have all been created by some secret method, which we now know to be the generative cause of religion. Namely, all these religions and societies are based upon the days of old when the aliens came, created mankind, fostered them, mated with them, did battle, and then disappeared. So here we have religious and historical texts giving us evidence, plain as day, of the ancient aliens. What we need now is physical evidence, pictures, artifacts, and structures that point to their existence in space and time. One amazing early sighting and artifact is the Lolodov Plate. It dates from 7000 BC and was found in Nepal. It clearly shows an alien, a ship, and a strange serpentine spiral leading to the bright sun at the center. What all this means we cannot know, but it is amazing. From even before this period, there are many strange cave drawings from Val Camonica in Italy. These wonderful images depict a great many things, including images of the ancient gods. Horns have been symbolic of light for thousands of years, and even Moses in the Bible is depicted with horns to represent his shining aspect. There are many depictions of aliens at this world heritage site, but what about actual flying machines or UFOs? Let us now turn to ancient India. In Indian folklore, the Vimana are mythological flying chariots. The Pushpika Vimana of the King Ravana is the most quoted example of a Vimana. Vimanas are mentioned in many places in Hindu and Sanskrit and also the Jain texts. 
The Sanskrit word vimana literally means measuring out, transversing, or having been measured out. It is a car or chariot of the gods and serves also as a throne. Some texts describe them as palaces with multiple stories. In some Indian languages like Tamil, Malayalam, Telugu, and Hindu, Vimana or Vimana means aircraft. Let us not forget that these great ships in the sky were seen thousands of years before mankind had even contemplated inventing aeroplanes. In the Vedas, the Vimana is depicted three times, twice flying in the sky and once landed on the ground. In fact, the Vedas have been flying machines before the Vimanas, great chariots that carried the gods in the sky in the same way as Ezekiel's wheel is seen to traverse the heavens in the Bible. The existing Rig Veda versions state that these machines were capable of jumping into space speedily with craft using fire and water containing 12 pillars, one wheel, three machines, 300 pivots, and 60 instruments. In the Hindu epic of Ramayana, the Vimana of Ravana is described as follows. The Pushpika Vimana that resembles the sun and belongs to my brother was brought by the powerful Ravana, that aerial and excellent Vimana going everywhere at will that chariot resembling a bright cloud in the sky. And the king got in, and the excellent chariot at the command of Rikhara rose up into the higher atmosphere. In Jain literature, the Vibana is a specific class of deity who dwell in the heavens. Lord Vishnu was so impressed by the devotion and singing of the Saint Tukaram that when his time came, a Viban or heavenly aircraft shaped as an eagle came to take him to heaven. So these are alien beings or gods that are not of this earth and who are more powerful, wise, and knowledgeable than mankind. They travel up and down from the heavens in grand flying chariots. But there is more evidence that these aliens visited mankind from across the world. Let us now take a look at the evidence from the Pueblo people of America and the aliens they call the Kachina. A Kachina is a being and have brought to light a series of rituals practiced by the Hopi, Zuni, Hopi Tiwa, and certain Karasin tribes, as well as in most Pueblo tribes in New Mexico. The Kachina are supernatural beings, and today there are special dances for them and Kachina dolls that are carved in their likeness. The Kachinas are believed to visit the Hopi villages during the first half of the year. Each area has their own pantheon of Kachinas, much like the Watchers of the Mesopotamian era. They have human-like relationships and families, and they are seen as great and powerful beings. They can bring rainfall like the Elohim, healing, fertility, and protection. They are no different to the other ancient aliens we have been discovering. In Hopi tradition, the Kachina came from the other world and settled with the Hopi. They were attacked and destroyed, and their souls returned from where they came. They left behind their clothes, masks, and instruments, and today the Hopi still dress as Kachina and carry out rituals. There is no belief that the tales of the Kachina are fictional. It is firmly believed that they were very real and did in fact come. Other aliens from around the world have been left to us in images we now call art. From around 5,000 years ago, there are amazing images in Australia, 
These alien beings known as the Wanjina and are beings represented as giants, just as we discovered when the Watchers mated with humans and created a race of giants. These aliens had no mouths or ears with cone-shaped heads. They are in fact reptilian or serpent-like. They are no different to the Ananuka Watchers or any other number of ancient alien sightings from around the world. And yet these civilizations are separated by thousands of miles and vast oceans. They are also said to have bred with humanity and created a hybrid race. In Utah, there are cave paintings created by the Anasazi and Fremont Native Americans that date back to 5000 BC. These are simply put, depictions of the ancient aliens large-eyed giants called the star people from where they came. It is said these aliens came down to earth, created mankind, and then returned to their heavenly home. The exact same story we have been finding across the world and a tale that can be found everywhere from China to Europe. Even the depictions of these aliens are the same and the powers they have is also the same. Again, the serpent is present, just as it is elsewhere. The oral traditions of the Anasazi states that these aliens bred once again with mankind and created a hybrid species that was superior to humanity. These images in stone are not fanciful fantasies. They are depicted alongside other quite normal animals, humans and plants, all depicted carefully. Why then would these images of the alien gods not also be depictions of what these ancient people actually saw? The fact is, these images are not alone. There are examples from Africa, China, Europe and elsewhere and they all tell the same tale. All tell the story of ancient aliens that came from the heavens, are linked as bright and shining beings with serpentine imagery, genetically engineered the human race, bred with them, and created giants in the land, had amazing technology, and then disappeared. But we have to ask the question, did these aliens really leave us alone, or have they been visiting us? In 1440 BC, the Thule Papyrus stated that the scribes of the Pharaoh Tutmosis III reported that fiery disks were encountered floating over the skies. In 218 BC, Livy recorded that phantom ships had been seen gleaming in the sky. In 76 BC, historian Pliny the Elder wrote about a bright spark that fell from a star and grew as it descended until it appeared to be the size of the moon. It then ascended back to the heavens and was transformed into a light. In 74 BC, the writer Plutarch stated that a Roman army commanded by Lucillus was about to begin a battle when all of a sudden the sky burst and a huge flame-like body was seen to fall between the two armies. In shape, it was most like a wine jar and in color, like molten silver. Plutarch tells us that the shape of the object is like a wine jar. This strange silvery object was reported by both armies. In 66 AD, the historians Josephus, Tacitus, and Eusebius of Caesarea recorded aliens. They stated as the Roman army marched on Jerusalem, 
there were chariots and armed angels seen to fill the sky. Historians today use all of these writers to explain history to us, and yet they leave these details out. What are they afraid of? Ridicule? In the 4th century BC, Julius Obsequens was a Roman writer who wrote a book entitled The Book of Prodigies and was an account of the wonders and portents that occurred in Rome between 249 BC through 12 BC. The book tells of strange objects that moved across the sky. In the early 15th century, Masolino de Panacale painted the miracle of the snow, clearly showing Jesus and Mary in the sky over the clouds that appear very UFO-shaped. This recorded a strange event when snow fell on a hot August day. In 1561, Residents of Nuremberg saw an aerial battle between alien crafts. Then suddenly, they saw a large black triangular object and then a large crash outside of the city. The witnesses observed hundreds of spheres, cylinders, and other ob-shaped objects that moved erratically overhead. In 1783, near Windsor Castle in England, a painting depicting an account by Thomas Sandby of a pale blue object entering the night sky from beyond. He stated that the glowing orb came to a standstill and changed directions during the encounter. In fact, the list is almost endless and comes right up to modern times with thousands of sightings across the globe. Bright shining craft seen in the sky, reptilian aliens with serpent-like aspects, observing mankind, or as our ancestors would say, watching. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engines running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero.